Some things just go together. Wine and cheese, flowers in springtime, and yes, books and bottles. We pair your favorite author with your favorite drink. Your host of Books and Bottles, Benita Johnson. Welcome to Books and Bottles. I'm your host, Benita Johnson. You're here again for our spirited literary conversation, and we're happy to have you. If this is your first time, you're in for a treat. This is the show where we introduce you to your new favorite author, his or her book, and we pair it with the wine or spirit. If you've been with us before, welcome back. Of course, the show, we invite authors to come on. If you have a creative project, hit us up at info at grosprod.com. Um, all right, so listen, we're going to jump right in. Our author today is Mr. Justin McMullen, and we're going to talk about his book, Case Number 1988. Justin. Hi, uh, how you doing? Good, how are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Thanks for taking some time to come and talk with me about your book. So before we get into the book, you're going to tell us who you are. Who is Justin? Well, Justin, uh, I'm from um, Champaign, Illinois. I've been writing um, at the age of four, actually. I used to write on uh, small little newspapers that my uh, dad would sit down after he get, got done reading them. And um, that love for writing just carried through all my life. And figured that that's something that I always wanted to do and got started on my first book and the rest is history. Oh, congratulations. So it's case number 1988, your first book? Yes, it's my first published book. Congratulations. How you feeling? It's, it's a surreal experience um, to have the feedback that I got on the book. Um, so much praise and I did not know it was going to affect my readers the way it did. Um, so many touching stories um, that people have shared with me as they were reading. And so it's, it's been definitely been a blessing. Good, beautiful. You know, I know it takes a lot of work and dedication to actually sit down and write a book. So how long did this project take you? Um, this project was actually uh, a two year project. And the reason why I want to say two years, because I had the idea in my head for some time. I just didn't really know how I wanted to set it up until I was um, one of my friends' fathers uh, told me something like he gave me a quote and um, I thought about it for a long period of time. And then I'm like, wait a minute, that's the hook. That's what I can add to the book. So um, after sitting down with it, doing multiple rough drafts, I finally came up with a really solid story that I thought I could share. And um, it just went from there. Good job. I enjoyed um, reading through it today to get ready for this conversation with you. So case number 1988. Let's just start with the title. Um, case number 1988. The 1988 is um, actually my birth year um, that I wanted to um, use um, for the title. Um, as far as the case goes, this is actually a story um, which deals with um, the main character, which is um, Justin, who's trying to fight a case that he lost to get out of a um, very strange one cell prison. And um, without giving too much away, the story goes through that case and um, to the conclusion. I enjoyed it a lot. Um, would you say that it was somewhat, um, it's autobiographical, but how much is it, you know, just like you, Justin? Pretty much all of it is me. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I would say 100% of it is me. I don't don't want to give too much away, but um, a, there's a lot of stuff in the story, even outside the parts where I actually go into actual events that took place in my life that I was really dealing with. I just needed to figure out a good way to um, tell that um, in the story. So, yeah, it's 100% me. It does have layers. So um, like when I was reading it, you know, I could tell it was, you know, a story, but like some of the, the characters in there in the beginning, I couldn't, you know, I was like, okay, are these real, you know, people in the flesh or is it something that he's dealing with internally? 
And I don't like to tell a lot about the book either because I really want the readers to read it. So um, just without telling too much, I mean, how do you kind of write? It's kind of like you were kind of in an internal struggle. Yes. Um, yes. When I was reading um, autobiographies, um, I noticed that there is a lot of um, external struggle. And what I wanted to do was tell an internal struggle because that's where a lot of the, you know, the issues that I was dealing with um, come from. And it, it was hard to convey that because I didn't want to lose the readers. I, um, Nigel, especially, who's happens to be everyone's favorite character, who I always get uh, messages about, is um, is extremely important to that. Um, he believes that he's a form of protection and actually he becomes something else um, as the story goes along. So as you, as we you said, don't want to give away too much, but um, I'm very, very familiar with Nigel and Peter, I would say, uh, personally in a, in a certain type of way. So Peter is definitely my favorite um, because- Wow, you are the first to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Nigel, and, I, and what you just said about Nigel, you know, feeling like he's the protector. But Peter was kind of like, to me, I found him to be the character that was the one that kind of exposed you and kind of allowed Justin in the book to kind of make it make his own decisions. Yes. yes. Allowed Justin to be be a grown up. Yeah, he yeah. Peter was um, the character that. I always said Nigel was probably the hardest to write, but I had to really figure out a balance for Peter and what he represented, who he was, and the effects that he had on um, Justin. Because at the start of the story and throughout most of the book, he has little, little to no power. Um, Nigel holds the power in the prison. Um, everything flows through Nigel. And while Peter does do his job, per se, in the book, the influence that he has is just not there and which forces Justin to like push him away and just gravitate more toward the quote unquote protector of the story, which is Nigel. Okay. I can see that. And um, like the other character, Miss Lawyer, mm. um, you know, she kind of, <laughs> what that character represented, what, which I like, it wasn't revealed until very close to the end of the book. Of the story, mm -hmm. so how yeah. challenging was it to write in that that female perspective too? But she, she was professional; was, she was still, you know, maternal almost. Yeah, she yeah. is definitely um, a mother figure in the story. Um, she was. I really had to sit down and take the lessons from the strong women I've um, learned from in my life. And um, I, I don't, I don't want to give it away, but she, she, I would say she's the heart of the book. Um, I had one Japanese fan who actually read the book, and he actually said the same thing. I've talked, to, I've talked to him for multiple hours since the book has released, and he indeed said that um, she was the heart of the book. And after going back through it, I did agree because she did get motherly vibe that um that was needed and what she what she went through to get Justin um, through all of his troubles in the book and the five events that he had to um, face. Um, I would say that she was the greatest quality, the greatest strength of the book. Definitely. Um, I had a question. I lost it that quick. Sometimes we forget. <laughs> I'm sorry. So your book, it came out in March, I believe. Yes, March 23rd, uh, 220 Publishing. Thank you, Glenn uh, Murray. Yes, Glenn. We have to praise Glenn. April um, is his birthday month. So, all you know, we got to tell everybody how great he is of 220 Publishing. Yeah, so. he only gets one from me in this, in this interview. He only gets one. Thank you, Glenn. <laughs> So how has the book done since its release? I guess by the time viewers see this, this will be out about a month or so. It has done amazing. Um, Glenn actually told me one, mo uh, one morning that it's the third fastest 
selling book in a two week span in uh, 220 publishing um, history. So that was big for me. I was really nervous on how it was going to do, but I'm so glad that word of mouth got out. Um, Glenn has been doing well with um, advertising and make sure that people actually see it. And the reception has been beyond my wildest imagination. So it's, it's, it's definitely a blessing. It's been doing amazing. Congratulations. Do you have a copy with you so you can hold it up? We like to show yes. folks the cover. I love the cover. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny how um, like we we have our own images of what people look like, you know, in the book. And, you know, it's interesting. Um, Nigel looks like Nigel. <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually had I worked with a guy named Dylan who's actually from the Philippines. He actually uh, worked with Disney. And um, it was actually I was actually really lucky to find him. And I have just started showing him the characters. And I was like, well, what do you think? What do you what do you see when um, when you read about these characters? And he drew up some sketches and we just we came up with a, a plan. And we was, I was like, I'm going to insert this in the book. So let me rewrite certain things. And um, it was amazing. So shout out to him. He did everything I asked and I couldn't be happier with the art. The art is awesome. Um, so we're gonna bring on, we have a guest today, our uh, partner in spirits, Miss Marcia McCall of Bubbles and Bourbon. Hey, Marcia. Hello, hello, hello. Hey, Marcia. Welcome back to Books and Bottles. Thank you, it's great to be here as always, pleasure. So what's going on in DC? Well, DC's have a really strange weather. Like it cannot decide if it's going to be spring or go back to winter right now. So it's very windy. Oh yeah, <laughs> I'm not far from in Richmond. So yeah, if we get that too. So yeah. what are you pairing with with case number 1988 today? So I am pairing a bottle of bubbly because it is your first book. It's rosé season, so we got to pop a bottle. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you I so much. It was a good year. I can relate. What a wonderful time frame. Um, so I'm doing a Southern Rhone rosé. It's like really mm. delicious. It's one of my favorites. I know, Justin, you're not a drinker. But um, it's a blend of Grenache, Syrah, and so. So it's really fruity and vibrant. Perfect for spring when it decides to come. But I believe in rosé all year round. So you can pair with barbecue, chicken, all the great usual suspects. Tuna tartare. And if you are into veggies, Try some rosé with tomato basin, like a basil bruschetta. I Thanks. love rosés as well, and I, I drink them all year. Yes, cheers to that. It's the best time to drink it. It's like, the, like a, besides white wine, it's the easiest drinkable year-round wine. You know, it just really doesn't matter the occasion. Rosé can literally go with anything. You can have it for breakfast, lunch, dinner. It doesn't matter. Breakfast, love, love breakfast <laughs> rosé. <laughs> yes, breakfast rosé. You got to start today for champions. Have some Cheerios and rosé. You rose, know the Cheerios, um, rose. you would drink the yes. um, like the pomplum wine, the pomplum mousse, um, yes. since it has that grapefruit essence. Yes, I always, yes. I love it in place of a mimosa. Really? Okay. I mean, I it's going off a little hard for me. But I like to ease on into the rosé. So I like trying to stay consistent. If it's a wine day, it's a wine day. Then I'll switch it up to spirits towards the end of the day so I can just sleep easily. <laughs> I hear you. How does how do our, our folks find you, Marcia? And what, what do you do? Tell us what you do. You don't just sit around and drink bubbles and bourbon all day, do you? Not all day. <laughs> I do so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Bubbles and Bourbon is a tasting story experience. Um, I provide education to, educational tutorials. I do tasting stories. So if you're interested in doing pairings, if you want to do like food and wine pairings, I can hit you up with that. I also sell wine with One Hope, which is based in Napa Valley. Um, I love teaching, so I do a lot of tutorials and classes that's like geared toward Blacks and white. There's a lot of Black culture and why coming up. I mean, there's 
over almost like almost a hundred really of blacks and spirits and blacks and wines in a combo. Like we have our own tequila now that's DC based. Like we have our own wine. So it's like I am just cheering everyone on and trying to get the word out and teaching everyone about wine. And I'm also bourbon certified too. So I got it all. Bubbles and bourbon. <laughs> you are you definitely a pillar in this. Um, black wine community and we appreciate you so how do our viewers find you and you know they want to book you to teach them or do something um, with them whether it's live or virtual yeah so i've been doing a lot of virtual events since the pandemic so i mean it's safe for everyone i know everyone's getting their vaccine so um but I think it's still good to do virtual events just because I know everyone has different COVID restrictions and how many people can be in capacity. But you can find me on Instagram, bubbles underscore in underscore bourbon. And then I'm on Facebook, bubbles and bourbon. But you can just Google me too, Marcia E. McCall, and you'll find me also. Thank you. So you're going to hang out with us for a little while as um, Justin yeah. and I continue to talk about I'm this book. enjoying the stories. I'm here for the stories. I'm relaxing. It's the evening. I will be here. Thank you. So just hang yeah. out. So Justin, yeah. I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. I know um, I've talked to other authors and they talk about, you know, writing their own stories and how hard it is because a lot of times people are thinking, um, why do I want to write my story and why does anybody care about my story? So what made you want to write your own story? Um, the biggest reason was as the story starts off as with me in middle school until I um, graduate. Um, that's I wanted to reach out to kids or young adults um, and let them know that it, you know, it's, it's cool to be yourself it's something that I had struggled with for a while. And um, I wanted to tell a story of someone who lived in that fear, who lived in that anxiety. And I wanted people to understand that um, your past shouldn't imprison you. And I, I had to add an element to that to get people to read it. And because um, I asked myself that from the beginning, how, why would people want to read this? And how can I explain it in a way that they get the external as well as the internal? And I think that we were able to achieve that. I think you did as well. Um, Cause as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, it, it start out, you know, you were telling this story. It almost felt like fiction, you know, in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. you know, which mm -hmm. um, kind of grips the audience kind of pulls us in. And then we realize that, you know, no, this story is, is much deeper. And yes. it's, you know, yes. a real story of um, perseverance and, of course, faith. Yes. 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 This is the big is one. The big um, one. Being able to yeah. have faith in the face of any storm is the only weapon you need. And that's what I definitely wanted to tell. You did that. So what's next? What are we right now? Uh, well, you can't be one and done. That's not how they work over at 220. <laughs> yeah. Oh, tell me about it. Glenn is uh, Glenn wants me to write a part two. Um, don't want to spoil anything, but with the ending of the book, it's kind of going to be hard to do that. But I'm going to see what can be done, um, especially with the reception I've gotten. Um, it is something that I'm thinking about. I do have a 10 year project that I've been working on for some time that is actually going to be a graphic novel. Spoilers, I didn't want to say nothing until next year, but you heard it here. So, um, yeah, um, I'm going to make an announcement next year, but I am looking into a sequel to Case. So when you, um, so are most of your books going to be geared towards like uh, adolescents? When no. You think no. Market is, okay. No, I think that um, Case is the only book. Well, I want it to be the um, only book that I write like that. Um, it was very, it was a very personal book. I was actually really afraid to put that out um, while I was writing it. But um, now that it's out and people understand the story, I, I want to be one and done, but we'll see what 220 says. I think that's 
Share, share your story. I mean, no one's going to know your story better than you. Is your message in a bottle, just like mine. Open it up. Let the world see. Let's all get a taste. Don't stop at just one vintage. Keep going. All right, we'll talk. Unfortunately, I got to talk it over with Glenn, and he's going to say yes. So, <laughs> yeah. I think, I, think, I think you're just a tremendous storyteller. And you know, the way you kind of pull us in. And when you mentioned graphic novels, I um homes I was a homeschool teacher for my boys. And you know, it was just hard for boys to to get them to read, especially some of the, you know, the pre preordained reading list that they would put out for young boys. It was nothing that interests them. And I think, you know, with the way that you wrote this book, it de is definitely of interest to boys, especially African American boys. Um, and when you mentioned a graphic novel, that was the only way I, that was how I started my boys wanting to read through graphic novels. Um, that's why I asked you the question about your market and what, what age group you're, you're looking at. Um, I want to go to, uh, young adults, teenagers. Um, that's what my graphic novel will be, um, geared to. Uh, I grew up. It's funny that you said that about your uh, your children. Um, I grew up reading Japanese manga. Um, my dad would go to every Sunday. We would go to this store and he would pick up like small little comics for me, and I would um, take them home and read them. So that's how I really got into reading. And then I moved on to novels. So, and while writing this book, I really wanted to give a visual aspect. This, which is why um, a lot of our advertisements are actually based on um, Japanese animation. So I wanted to grab people and uh, pull them in. And the story is very descriptive. So they, you do get a visual of everything that's going on. So I really wanted that element in the case. So who, who influenced you? Do you have any favorite authors? Um, Akira Toriyama. Um, he's the uh, creator of Dragon Ball. He actually does do novels as well. Um, I'm really, really into his work. Um, I would say without him, I would have never started writing. Um, so he's he's probably the person that I uh, spend the most time um, whenever I'm reading. Very good. So, what do you think? Um, do you watch? Do you watch TV? You do a lot of TV and watch movies? <laughs> no, actually, I don't. Which is okay, because I was going to ask you, like, you know, about like the way some of the movies are coming out now. Some of, um, you know, you take like Justin Peel, mm. or uh, mm -hmm. I can't think of the other person named the guy who did uh, Little Somebody who did them. You know, just some of the way these stories are being told. Um, your book, you know, it kind of felt like that a little bit. You know, the way they're telling these stories about our personal pain. Um, so that that was why I asked you, you know, do you watch TV? Because I wanted to know, you know, how you felt about some of those types of stories. Like um, Get Out would be one or Us, you know, something like that. Get Out is yeah. is a amazing movie. Um, I do like the fact that Jordan is not afraid to take risks. Um, he's actually, he does a lot of stuff. He get out. I did. We're having a little bit of technical difficulties. You're kind of freezing up a little bit, just kind of freezing up. But while 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 he's working that out, I just want to let our our viewers know. Um, look for case number 1988 by author Justin McMullen on Amazon. Um, you know, if you have a Kindle device, you can download it and read it on your devices, or you can order the hard copy of the book. Are you back, Jordan? He's coming. He's coming. All right, well, we got look. Since while we wait, we're gonna do that. We'll talk about you know, I found, um, speaking of rosé, since we were talking about one today, mm -hmm. I found a really nice, sparkling, it was a, it's a cava, okay. but okay. it's made from Pinot Noir grapes. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. common. Because, I mean, I was, was, you know, that like the skin color 
This comes from contact. So Pinot Noir is a common grape to make some rosé out of just because it's a lighter skin grape. Yeah, and it was really good Um, because I couldn't remember having, if I had any, a sparkling Pinot Noir from Spain. I, I think that may have been my first one. That was oh, a I Pinot Noir. Paid, I paid plenty, but no, okay. I Rosé all day, but Spain is kind of like my second love. Like my first love of wine in the intro was um, Argentinian Malbec. So I was like more fruit forward in the beginning. And then I really started venturing off into like Spanish wines and everything like that. So I do love rosé. Spanish rosés are fun. I mean, rosé is really fun, honestly, because if you think about it, you're taking all these like red grapes and um, you're just blending them, maceration, and you're just kind of playing with the skin contact and the flavor component to see what's going to come out of it. Like some rosés could be really light, some could be really dark. It's just really fun because you're never going to know what you're exactly going to get. I mean, a lot of people like dry rosés, but then you have your sweeter ones, but it's just a fun varietal that everyone can play with. I love them all. So Justin's back. Hey, hey. Welcome back, Justin. Good. <laughs> so when, um, when we lost you, you were talking a little bit. You were saying um, you like Justin Peel because he takes risk. And I was, you know, comparing you and him because I felt like your book was almost written in a style, you know, like it, looking at his movies, you don't always know exactly where it's going. But once, you know, you got it, you got it. And so I kind of felt like that when I was reading your book. Yeah, I did use that element of, um, I took a page out of his book. He actually does a lot of stuff on YouTube explaining um, some of his writing styles. And you can actually find very detailed scripts that he's, uh, for various projects that he's done. So um, adding that element of mystery and slowly giving breadcrumbs that, you know, connect a bigger picture is something that I really wanted to uh, to do because you don't want to just flat out just tell every tell like uh, especially with Nigel and Peter um, I thought I gave away too much at the beginning but um, unfortunately my readers by the end of the book they were like yeah we got it we we definitely understand now so I must uh, I must be slow because I didn't get it <laughs> in the beginning you know it took me a minute you know how you kind of think something you mm -hmm. like and uh but you know you i think you did a great job i mean the book is just under um 200 pages but you know we got pretty far in the book mm -hmm. well at least mm -hmm. i did you know before <laughs> <laughs> before you know putting all the pieces together and kind of you know figuring out what these characters what are who they represented yeah i was yeah. afraid of that um i was afraid that i gave away a little bit too much but um, luckily that wasn't the case and I'm glad that people received these characters as well as they did, especially Nigel. Um, he was who I was pushing for people would understand the most and they definitely did. Yeah, I, I understood him. Um, even though Peter's my favorite. So, <laughs> so I'm going to be writing letters to 220 on your behalf so they can, you know, keep you publishing. But, uh. um, how do our, our viewers find you and get a copy of case number 1988? Case is available. Case 1988 is available on Amazon. And you can also find me on Instagram at uh, J Ryan Works. And I have a website, Justin Ryan, www.justinryanworks.com, where I'll post updates um, to future projects, um, things of that sort. So, yeah, you can find me there. And we definitely will and encourage our folks to get a copy of the book and support you and just let your numbers keep growing over at Amazon. Marcia, tell us one more time how we can find you. All right. You can find me on Instagram, double underscore in underscore bourbon at G, I'm sorry, at, on Instagram. And then uh, you can find me on Facebook, Bubbles and Bourbon. And if you want my email, it's bubbles.bourbon at gmail.com. 
Thank you. And I'd like to thank you both again for being with me today on Books and Bottles. To our viewers, thank you again. If you are an author and you'd like to be on the show, hit us up at info at grosprod.com. I'm your host, Benita Johnson, owner of the Vine Wine Club and proud sponsor of Books and Bottles. I'll see you next week for another edition. Cheers. Thank you. Camped out at home for COVID? Cheers. Join us, NDTV where you will see the talk shows, movies, drama, action, and comedy. Be the first and see it first. Sign up now for free at NDTV.